Hello and welcome, this is Antwolf and I'm bringing to you all a new long let's play of Dragon Age Origins developed by Bioware and published by Electronic Arts in 2009. This is going to be the 2010 Ultimate Edition which includes a number of the DLC that was released later after the main game was uh, which some of it I will be doing, some of it I won't be doing depends how I feel at the time uh, as always with these long let's plays, I basically just want to have a spend a couple of minutes talking about what this let's play is going to involve and you can decide whether or not it's going to be for yourself. This is mostly a blind let's play. I have played maybe about a quarter of the game. I have this habit of starting the game again and trying out a different um, story arc, like story arcs at the beginning because Similarly to Bioware's Mass Effect, um, which was released about the same time, this is an RPG in the swords and sorcery kind of genre, when you can choose your class at the beginning, choose your race at the beginning, and for in Dragon Age, there's actually different opening scenes, different prologues you can play, and there is a number of endings as well. Those I mostly know about, but I've never actually got to them myself. This is quite an unforgiving game at certain points, when micromanaging it, your party is can be important. Whereas I have been, of late anyway, more of the point of playing my main character and letting the AI organise the rest. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's very bad. My character I plan to roleplay in this is going to be a human, uh, he's going to be a rogue-like character and for roleplay purposes, unlike how I normally play games, he is going to be very religious. Um, the religion in the game is called the Chantry, in the, in the land of Ferelden anyway, that is the main religion and they worship the Maker, which is their god basically. Um, with this in mind, if my character is going to be very maker-blessed, maker-happy, he's not going to be very kind to a particular race and a particular cast of people, I suppose you can say. So that's going to make some interesting situations. The last couple of times I've tried to play this, I've tried to play the perfect Paragon character. And this game puts you in situations when you can't really do that. So, it's going to be a break from how I normally play the game, but it's going to make it different for me and it's going to make an interesting viewing, I hope so anyway. So, with that in mind, let's start a new game and see where we go. I am using some uh, mods. Um, I will put them in the description below the video to say which ones I'm using. Most of them are just appearance customizers to give my characters a bit more of a livelier look. A few more additional hairstyles, which I may or may not use. The major one, I suppose, well, the major two, there is a stat uh, respecification mod, which means that if I mess up and accidentally put a talent where I don't want to, down the road I can craft a potion and change that skill, which is beneficial. It might break the game slightly at points, but I'll try not to do that. And the other one is to allow the Warhound you do get in your party to become a permanent fifth slot in your um, combat team, I suppose you can call it, in your party. So I will have an extra person basically on the field when we fight. Which is kind of law friendly. There is a lot of lore in this game. I won't be exploring a lot of it apart from obviously what your character encounters. But there's a lot of codex reading you can do. And it tells you all about the black, the back plot of the story and the world that you are actually in. So with that in mind, let us start a new game. I do believe there's a cutscene here, so I will mute myself while it's playing. And then I will see you in the character customization. So I'll see you in a moment. Let's start this game and be right back. Oh, I'll speak this. And so is the Golden City blackened. With each step you take in my hall, Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting. You have brought sin to heaven and doom upon all the world. The Chantry teaches us 
that it is the hubris of men which brought the Darkspawn into our world. The mages had sought to usurp heaven, but instead they destroyed it. They were cast out, twisted and cursed by their own corruption. They returned as monsters, the first of the Darkspawn. They became a blight upon the lands, unstoppable and relentless. The Dwarven kingdoms were the first to fall, and from the deep roads, the dark spawn drove at us again and again until finally we neared annihilation. Women from every race, warriors and mages, barbarians and kings. The Grey Warden sacrificed everything to stem the tide of darkness and prevail. Four centuries since that victory, and we have kept our vigil. We have watched and waited for the Darkspawn to return. But those who once called us heroes have forgotten. We are few now, and our warnings have been ignored for too long. with my own eyes what lies on the horizon. Maker, help us all. So yeah, there's the intro scene. I hope you all enjoyed. And yes, let us go to our character generation. Uh, the background you select will determine which uh, of the six distinct opening stories you will play through. It also affects how characters respond to you throughout the game. This is important because, as it is, there is a lot of choices you make in the game depending on how your companions and how your... Excuse me. Your non-playable characters, the NPCs you encounter, will react to you. So I, of course, will be male. I will be human. And as I said, I will be playing the roguish class, but I'll quickly tell you about the different races because this kind of gives you a back plot on the different races in the game. So obviously, first of all, humans. The most numerous yet the most divided of all the races, only four times have they ever united under a single cause. Religion and the Chantry play a large part in human society. It distinguishes them culturally from the elves and dwarfs more than anything else. And then the, elv the elvish. Once enslaved by humans, most elves have all but lost their culture, scrounging an impoverished living in the slums of human cities. Only the nomadic Dalish tribes still cling to their traditions, living by the bow and the rule of their old gods as they roam the ancient forests. And finally the dwarves. Originally bound by caste and tradition, the dwarves have been raging a losing war for generations trying to protect the last stronghold of their once vast underground empire from the Darkspawn. Dwarves are very tough and have a high resistance to all forms of magic, thus preventing them from becoming mages. And as you can see, the mage class is 
um, unselectable f for dwarven people. But that's fine, we don't want to be a mage anyway, we are being the rogues. And because of this, it's automatically put us on the noble human background. Um, the noble human background, I suppose that's right. Because as that class, that's the only starting point we can play as. So, human noble. Born to wealth and power, second only to royalty, you find your training in both diplomacy and battle put to the test as your brother leads the bulk of your family's forces to war in the south. And that's the same if you play as the warrior as well. So, human noble. That's a thing. Um, as a rogue, rogues are skilled adventurers who come from all walks of life. All rogues possess some skill in picking locks and spotting traps, making them valuable assets to any party. Technically, they are not ideal frontline fighters, but if rogues can circle around behind their target, they can backstab to devastating effect. They are they have specializations. Um, they also get benefits in dexterity, willpower, and cunning, which is absolutely fine by me. Greetings. And now we have the entire appearance and voice customization. I'm going to basically pause this video and play around with this until I get something I like because I don't want to bore you all for about 5-10 minutes as I make my character. So I will be right back and then we will continue with the generation. So, see you in a moment. Hello and so welcome back. I spent about 5 minutes just playing around with my character creation there and managed just to create this guy. Who I've called Anforis. Anforis Coolsland of the Coolsland family. Uh, of the Coolsland noble family, in fact. So, I've chosen my voice as I just kept it as the wise, so you can hear that a little. I need by, please. Till we meet again. <laughs> yes, and with that, let us continue. So, the next thing we get to play is our attributes. Which is, we can um, spend to increase our stats, basically. So, of course, we have Strength, which measures the, uh, the character's physical prowess and directly affects the damage a character deals in physical combat. It also contributes to the accuracy of melee attacks. Uh, it's quite good for rogues, but not the most essential skill. I think Dexterity is the next, is the best one for rogues. It's a measure of agility, reflexes, and balance. High dexterity improves a character's chances to hit, makes the character more likely to dodge, and contributes to the damage dealt by piercing weapons like daggers or arrows. Archery and dual weapon fighting style demands high dexterity to master, making this attribute, attribute a favourite for rogues. I will probably be going dual daggers, possibly, and so dexterity is probably the one I want to mainly concentrate in, but I'll show you the rest. We have Willpower, which represents the character's determination and mental fortitude. Um, obviously, it's primarily a mage skill, but for warriors and rogues, Willpower grants more stamina for combat techniques and special attacks, which is something to bear in mind. Magic is the measure of the character's men uh, natural affinity for the arcane, another major, um, like a magic-based um, attribute to level up. But it also determines how effective potions, poultices, and slabs are. So even though it's pro the willpower and magic are primarily magic-based mage skills, their um, attributes to level up, they do also have benefits to melee classes as well. Cunning determines how well a character learns and reasons. Most skills such as herbalism and combat tactics require a quick mind and master. Rogues benefit most from this statistic, as many of their class abilities and special attacks rely on subtlety and reading the target. And finally, constitution represents cell, um, health and resilience. Higher constitution directly increases the amount of damage a character can take before falling on the battlefield. An interesting skill, I ho I'm hoping not to take too many hits. I'm hoping to try and avoid direct combat, and as most rogues do in... Um, attacking from behind. Uh, with this in mind, I want to put more points in the cunning, more points in the dexterity, maybe another one into strength, and then we have two more points. Should I put some in the constitution or dexterity again? I think we'll stick with dexterity at the moment and maybe put some points in the cunning later on as we level up. 
our skills. We have skills and talents, two separate things in this game. Skills are make your crafting abilities or the combat training, whereas your talents are your abilities that you can use in the game. Um, that's probably a bit confusing. I probably didn't explain it as well as I could, but you'll understand it as we play through it. Um, at the moment, we have some skill in poison making and the basic combat training skill, which means we have access to our first tier weapon talents. We can also unlock coercion, stealing, trap making, survival, herbalism and combat tactics. I want to put a point into coercion because this uh, this balances with my cunning and the character is influential enough to convince others to change their views. Strength contributes more to an intimidating character whereas cunning contributes to a more persuasive character. And I want to be persuasive because that might get me out of trouble. And then our talents which is our abilities in the game. We have one unlocked at the moment. That is the roguish. These are like the rogue class skills. And then you have your weapon class skills. Dual wielding or archery. Uh, we have dirty fighting. Where the rogue in incapacitates a target who takes no damage from the attack but is stunned for a short time. So that's worthwhile having. What else can we do? We can't unlock these because they require level 4 but we could have below the belt. Dealing norm normal combat damage as well as imposing penalties to defense and movement speed. Deft hands. Opening locks and spotting traps. So deft hands is a passive skill which could be handy for um, unlocking unlocking um, locked chests or trunks basically. As well as spotting some traps which could um, put us in some trouble. We have stealth, where the rogue has learned to fade from you, view, although perceptive, perceptive enemies may not be fooled. Taking any action beyond movement, including engaging in combat or using items, will still attract attention. But the first attack, while stealthed, is automatically a critical hit or a backstab, which is very nice. I want to do deft hands because it's a passive skill and there will be um, doors and trunks I want to pick at because I'm a rogue, why wouldn't I want to do that? And do we want some weapons training? Maybe dual weapon training or stealth? Hmm, decisions, decisions. Stealth is nice. But dual weapon training, ah, we'll go with stealth. We'll play the pure rogue. But dual weapon training, they allow us to um, deal normal combat damage with the offhand weapon as well. Whereas at the moment, I think we're attacking with a penalty for using an offhand weapon. Yeah, that's going to be a bugger, but that's fine. It's still, it's obviously the beginning of the game. We haven't even done anything yet. And I think that's all the customization we can do. So let us play the game. I say this is a long game, there's a lot of people you can talk to, a lot of conversations do crop up in this game. I will be role playing as Anforus himself. There's a lot of spoken dialogue for the other characters, whereas I will be spe speaking the dialogue options I choose for him. And bear in mind that obviously I'm role playing him as a very chant a chantry happy uh, rogue. Who is of course also a noble. So hopefully I keep to my can uh, my character basically, and I'll try not to make decisions that wouldn't be correct for him. But it should be interesting. Let's get the show on the road. We will be playing on normal difficulty. You see, this is this is quite a hard game I find because I don't like to micromanage too much. Um, I will be playing on normal, but there might be points when I do switch it up to easy. But obviously, I'm just telling you that straight off, obviously, so you're aware of that fact. So, let's get going. For generations, your family, the Kuzlans, has stewarded the lands of Hyever, earning the loyalty of your people with justice and temperance. 
When your country was occupied by the Orlesian Empire, your father and grandfather served the embattled kings of your land. Today, your elder brother takes up House Kuzlan's banner in service to the crown. Not against the men of Orlais, but against the bestial darkspawn rising in the south. I trust then that your troops will be here shortly. I expect they will start arriving tonight, and we can march tomorrow. I apologize for the delay, my lord. This is entirely my fault. No, no. The appearance of the Darkspawn in the South has us all scrambling, doesn't it? I only received the call from the King a few days ago myself. I'll send my eldest off with my men. You and I will ride tomorrow just like the old days. True. But we both had less grey in our hair then. And we fought all lesions, not monsters. <laughs> At least the smell will be the same. I'm sorry, Papa, I didn't see you there. How? you remember my son. I see he's grown into a fine young man. Pleased to see you again, lad. And you, all how? My daughter Delilah asked after you. Perhaps I should bring her next time. Delilah's quite a bit younger than I am. <laughs> As you get older, those years make less difference. A lesson often hard won. I doubt he'll be receptive, how? My fierce boy has his own mind these days, make her bless his heart. As uniquely talented as his father, I'm sure. At any rate, Pop, I summoned you for a reason. While your brother and I are both away, I'm leaving you in charge of the castle. I'll do my best, father. Now, that's what I'd like to hear. Only a token force is remaining here, and you must keep peace in the region. You know what they say about mice when the cat is away, yes? There's also someone you must meet. Please, show Duncan in. It is an honor to be a guest within your hall, Tyrion Coosland. Your Lordship, you didn't mention that a Grey Warden would be present. Duncan arrived just recently, unannounced. Is there a problem? Of course not. But a guest of this stature demands certain protocol. I am at a disadvantage. We rarely have the pleasure of seeing one in person, that's true. Pup, Brother Aldous taught you who the Grey Wardens are, I hope. They defeated the Darkspawn long ago. Not permanently, I fear. Without their warning of the Darkspawn rising now, half the nation could have been overrun before we'd had a chance to react. Duncan is looking for recruits before joining us and his fellow Wardens in the South. I believe he's got his eye on Sir Gilmore. If I might be so bold, I would suggest that your son is also an excellent candidate. Honor though that might be, this is one of my sons we're talking about. Is there a reason I shouldn't join them? You did just finish saying that Grey Wardens are heroes, old friend. I have not so many children that I'll gladly see them all off to battle. Unless you intend to invoke the right of conscription. Have no fear. While we need as many good recruits as we can find, I have no intention of forcing the issue. Pup, can you ensure that Duncan's requests are seen to while I'm gone? Of course. In the meantime, find Fergus, and tell him to lead the troops to Ostagar ahead of me. And where is this Fergus? Upstairs in his chambers, no doubt. Spending some last moments with his wife and my grandson. Be a good lad and do as I've asked. We'll talk soon. And so, yeah, there was the first dialogue scene. Um, a few things to point out, obviously, as a human noble, and it has been mentioned, or you can conject, I am the second-born son of Bryce Coolsland, who is the turn or the lord of High Ever Castle. Um, our older brother, Fergus, is to most likely inherit the title of lordship after our father obviously either passes away or retires steps back and fergus already has a, a son so really the chances of you inheriting any titles are quite slim unless you marry well into another noble family and so obviously what duncan was mentioning in there the, the gray warden here 
there is a thing they have, the Grey Ones, called the Right of Conscription, where basically they can choose any one from any race and any culture, basically to become or possibly become a Grey Warden. And that was, like, that's a half decent option if I'm that like-minded, if I feel like I could become a Grey Warden, because without becoming a Lord of High Ever, because my brother's gonna inherit that, you know, there's not much opportunity for me apart from, well, whatever make whatever I make of it myself. So, there's a quite a few things I can show you in, like, obviously we've got the action bar here, we have a few uh, menus to grow the show. But I will leave those for part two, uh, which I will show, which I will put on in a few moments. Um, I'll get recording it. So, this has been Anfulf, and I hope you've all enjoyed this introduction to Dragon Age Origins, and I will see you all next time. Take care, and bye-bye.